Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today Donna will discuss data lake architecture, modern strategies and approaches. As you can see, WebEx has undergone a significant UI update, so feel free to look around. You will find the most of the needed icon buttons in the bottom middle of your screen. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, click the familiar chat icon again in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you the speaker of this series, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. Uh, in fact, hey, Donna. Hello. Hi. Hello and welcome. All right, well, we will get started. Um, so as Shannon mentioned, today's topic is on data lake and the architecture and approaches around that, always a very hot topic in the industry. Um, and we'll mention this again, um, that all of these webinars, as Shannon mentioned, it's a series and they are all available on demand. So any of the, if any of the past topics are of interest to you, they're all available on the Dataversity website and this will be available on the website after the session. Uh, we also hope you can join us in the upcoming ones for this year uh, on master data and some other key topics like data modeling. Um, and we are just putting together the roundup for next year. So on that note, if anyone has any topics next year that they are dying to hear about or are interested in, please use the chat or the uh, Q&A or chat. Uh, let me know because we'll be putting together before the end of the month. So if there's any of the typical topics that you haven't been hearing and you'd love to hear, we are open to that. Um, so. Um, without further ado, a little bit on data lakes, and we've all heard now, you know, data lake, data swamp, data sewer, whatever people have words they use. Um, but I don't want to be negative because I think data lakes do have a lot of opportunity, and this is why they have become so popular. And like anything, I guess I'm old enough where I get a bit jaded, and you hear that about any technology, and certain technology here, data warehouses don't work because because what there's work involved and people are people and there have been data warehouses that have failed and there's also been very successful data warehouses. MDM, can, et cetera. Any technology we'll ever mention on this webinar, there have been good ones and there have been bad ones. So um, I do think there's a lot of opportunity around data lakes, which is why they're so popular. But like anything, without the proper architecture, without metadata, without coordination between teams, it can quickly devolve into a swamp, particularly because data lakes are by their very nature, cross-functional and have a lot of different disparate data sources and, you know, very quickly that can, that can sort of devolve into chaos. So here's just a few tips um, on how to hopefully avoid that based on practices we've seen in our practice. Um, but let's start with the opportunity because if you know me, I love to be positive, which is why I'm in data because it's a lot of cool stuff you can do nowadays. So data lake is almost the epitome of that. Because data, you know, we can talk about a data warehouse and throughout this we will make the comparison between data lakes and data warehouse. So it's not like we say if we just take one subject area and there, there's many different opportunities you can use for data lake, but consumer or customer tends to be one of the more popular. So it's not like we've not been getting a, a view of customer and a lot of related information around customer, but with data lakes, the opportunity is even even broader because data now is so much broader. So think of social media. Here's your typical customer living on their iPhone, right? Um, you know, social media interactions. Are they on Twitter? Are they on um, Are they on LinkedIn? What are they saying about your brand? Voice of customer. Have they called your support line? Can we do voice to text? Can we see scan support logs? Are there photos, videos, um, you know, video chat or things they might have uploaded to the internet that we want to see? Can we look at actual purchasing patterns? Do we know where they've been from their phone or other systems? Do we know that they've been on our website and they've been clicking on certain things? Do, are they wearing an Internet of Things device? We can see what, how they're using it. 
uh, do, is our product in and of things enabled and we can see user patterns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What all of those have in common is that very few of those are stored in a typical relational database. Just some of those you could. Um, most of them are, are sort of very high volume um, and, and sort of happening real time or happening, you know, disparately across time periods that may be high volume at one part of the web, web clip. You're not doing that continually, but when you're on it, there's a lot of activity. So that's sort of, you know, we'll use the term big data, and that's another overused term, and you know, the whole webinar just on that. Um, but that is the challenge of the data lake. How do you, you know, you don't write select star from IoT. You know, there's a you can, I guess, in some instances. But that's really not the idea with the little video, you know, select star from video. This is a whole other area that isn't well suited to a relational database. So thus, this idea of the data lake and store all of these disparate information pieces together to do sort of next generation analysis. Um, which links to big data. And I guess if you've, unless you've lived in a cave, you've probably heard the idea of the three Vs or the four Vs or the five Vs, however <laughs> many Vs people come up with when it comes Another V, valid, um, which is why you keep hearing them so often. But they are, as I mentioned, high volume. And again, you could roll your eyes and say, well, we've had high volumes of information for a long time, but you know, these can be up to terabytes per minute per day. But, you know, there's a lot of information, it's high volume, um, rapid. And we may have had this volume before. Um, but weren't able to really analyze it like we are. A friend of mine, he's, um, he's a weather analyst, um, and his father was a weather analyst. People can stick together. There's a lot of cool things done in weather. Um, and literally, the father was saying what they they used to do some of this analysis. And there was a building in Wyoming with server after, I guess it's still there, a server after server after server. He said, even what was in the building in the 70s and 60s when he was doing this doesn't compare to what most people have in their laptop. And he said, I'm so jealous of you. I'm too old to be doing this stuff now. But if I had had the capacity that you guys have today, and they are, and weather is a good example of high volume of information to, to, to manage. So he said, yeah, I'd love to have the capabilities you can, which is why some of this data science, why these data lakes have come done, because we can store more. High velocity, as I mentioned, they're generated every second. You know, think of IoT. You've got a machine, you know, kind of putting out, you know, think of weather, just putting out weather, weather feeds every second, every millisecond, whatever. And, and variety is the picture I mentioned before. It's machine data, it's media files, it's log files, it's things that may be a relational databases. There's areas in a lake that you can put relational, you know, hive or um, certain table-like structures, but that's really not the value of a data lake. You know, if you're just doing relational databases, I wouldn't recommend using a lake. It is, it's what relational databases are good for. Um, it's really getting these other ideas. And, and back to that idea of you're getting insight, right? Is it sentiment analysis across social media channels? Is it Web browsing analytics, is it looking through sensor data and machine logs to get patterns? Is it customer support call log analysis? All of these things, again, are varied and, and cross-functional. And that's really the idea of it. To get value from these massive amounts of systems requires different tools. So different analytical tools, like statistical analysis or you know, R and Python and things like that, um, and sitting on a platform that is more of a data lake uh, than a relational database. Um, but the business need, uh, again, data warehouses don't go away. Uh, again, it's just expanding the capabilities we already have. So you might have your typical business user, right? Because you just say what customers are saying about our product. That also doesn't mean that things are less complicated. In many ways, they're more so. So if you kind of live in the traditional database and data warehouse world, you know how complex just that is. Even if we had everything on one of these systems, all on SQL Server, all in a similar format, even just getting that, tell me everything about customer. Well, they might be named different ways in different databases. They have different formats. There's different integrations. You know, ETL is around for a reason. That that getting all of that together um, can be complicated. But now compound that. I mean, big data in the data lake world. There's a, a your elusive data scientist, right? Trying to input those raw data sources and and really parse that out and analyze that and make it relevant. So I think, and you know, again, I'm been around for a while. <laughs> I'm starting to feel like I'm around for a while. Um, I think in the big, in the early days, there's a lot of over-promising of data lakes. Yeah, just sort of dump stuff in there and magic comes out the other side. And maybe uh, folks still feel that way, but nothing's magic, right? It's just work one way or the other. Um, you just sort of parse it more a schema on read um, rather than schema on write, which is more your traditional data warehouse where I'm designing that system. And then I build it uh, big data. That's sort of the idea. You're discovering things as you parse through the data and analyze it. Um, so again, 
okay, we had four Vs, right? We had the right, you know, the volume, velocity, and variety, which are kind of more your typical ones, and then value, which is how, what's the value from that, and veracity is sort of similar. Of do we know this is right? So you can put a lot of stuff out in that. Um, how do I know it's true? How do I know it's the right? It's the cleanse data. So you know, we've probably all seen some of these. You see some of these uh, figures, and some of us might be living it today, right? right? So, you know, this, you know, I get the, term, the, the data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Why don't they say metadata manager is the sexiest job of the 21st century, right? Because a lot of people, what you want to get to is the insights. And so you may have a, a you know, analytics degree, and you want to do all the great insights, but you spend 15 minutes of your time just cleaning and formatting the data. And some of us, Nerds like me find that fun, um, but that, that has its limit. You know, no one, no one sort of went and got their degree to clean up name data and make it all consistent. That's that's sort of what the means to the end, right? So a lot of people are frustrated. We're spending all this time to cleanse the data, um, trying to connect that poor data quality, the the in the lower left. You could spend 80% of your time during the day, right? So you you want to spend the time doing the analysis um, up in the upper right. This idea that you know, without metadata, without understanding the data definitions, that can often be one of the biggest success of a data lake um, from writing the advisors did a survey with that. So, you know, but at the upside in the lower right, this idea that most people want to digitize their business, you know, digital transformation is huge. And when we think of digital transformation, a lot of that has to do with quick stream analysis, voice of customer, all the things we were talking about. But a lot of the biggest barrier is trying to find that right data, or once you find that right data and get it in the right place or have it in the lake, then the data is inconsistent, right? So again, these problems don't go away with the data where, uh, with the data lake; um, they're just compounded in a way. Um, but big data is a growing trend. Um, I've mentioned this in previous webinars, and it's available on the Data Diversity website as well as ours on Global Data Strategy. Uh, we had done a architecture survey last year, and we'll be doing another one this year, so stay tuned. We'd love your input. Um, that over 70% of organizations are either using a big data solution today or are using it in the future. And when you look at the use cases, it's a lot of what we just mentioned, either data science and discovery, sort of this sandbox exploration, and doing analytics on discovery on these new data sources that we couldn't before. Um, and, you know, some of this idea, I guess, machine learning and AI would be similar to that and things like Internet of Things data um, are some of the big drivers for big data. Um, but again, some of the concerns, some of this governance, uh, we didn't put that on the list, but the top right in concern of big data was how we govern it, right, which is what we were talking about before. Security is also a big concern. You can't necessarily, a lot of these solutions are out in the cloud. Um, you don't just willy nilly dump PII or personal information out there. Um, I think we all know that, but sometimes trying to govern or manage that can be a challenge. And, and again, they're not easy. So the complexity of those solutions and the skills required, you may not have in-house. You may have to train. You may have to outsource. So again, there's a lot of opportunity around big data and data lakes, um, but they don't come without their, their risks and concerns as well. So it's the idea of balancing that. There's immense opportunity, but with anything, we need to balance it with the idea of, of you know, reducing risk and increasing opportunity. And there's many ways, but two ways I'll talk about in this session is the idea of the architectural ways you can manage risk, and then the, the governance ways. And we have a whole webinar on how architecture and governance are interlinked and two sides of the same coin. But with architecture, the scalability, how do we scale cost? A lot of the reasons people go to a, a, sort of a data lake is a city of cost uh, or cloud. Um, latency, how fast can we get the information? Is it real time? Um, you know, one of the concerns of a warehouse is the, the idea that you may have to, you know, do refreshes. Maybe you get it weekly, daily, monthly, um, but you probably want that more real time with the data lake. And then this idea of how we store diverse data sources. So that's sort of some of the basic architecture. Then we get to the governance. How do we secure that? How do we handle privacy and compliance? And I think most important, uh, well, not most, but one of the most important cons a consideration is this idea of collaboration between new roles. Often you have data scientists working with more traditional data architects or BI teams working with citizen data science. And not only is it a different way of working, a uh, different way of governing, but also the tools are very different. Um, yet if you don't 
how those teams work together, you lose most of the value. Because, you know, the idea is, say, we want that voice of customer. You know, your core customer data may be in master data, your master data system and or your warehouse. You really need to link that together. Uh, otherwise, the, you really lose the value. So how, how do we get all of that working together? Um, and you've seen this slide if you've seen me talk before, but people say they like it. So I keep using it, right? So, but it, it says some um, core things. It's one, what's the business strategy? Um, so why are we looking at some of this information? And I know sometimes we do it just for fun, right? Sometimes I'm, I don't know. Maybe I'm doing and just doing some exploration. But generally, these data lakes work better um, with a business strategy. And I'll tease one company we work with that we're named Nameless. It was sort of a, a very core commodity. I don't, know, I don't want to give away what it was, but you know, a, a sort of you know, think of it keeps the lights on in the company. It wasn't a consumer product, but one e eager data scientist wanted to do some analysis on Twitter sentiment. We did a lot of work on that, and I was just so I'm curious how many people tweeted about this brand. He so called two last year, and said their bill was late. You know, it it really was not the right strategy for that business. They were more maybe, maybe the Internet of Things might have been better for that company it was more of a you know I would say manufacturing but it was more of a commodity type product um, it wasn't something that voice of customer was very concerned with I think we're with today um, in the UK and, and it's a retail customer product that's hugely important to them voice of customer and Twitter and we did the similar analysis and there's you know thousands of people per day tweeting about this product because it's something that they use in their daily life so look at the business strategy before we go too far down into the um, technical strategy. Um, and that may be obvious, but all of us get excited about technology, and then we sort of lose sight of that. The other part is what, what data, if we go sort of bottom up, um, what data sources are we looking at? You know, big data, unstructured data, semi-structured, maybe it really is only relational databases. We don't need a data lake for that, right? Or maybe it is more Internet of Things. We do. Um, how do you coordinate that? And then what, what are the ways we want to manage that through data quality, architecture, et cetera? And then governance is that layer that really gets the um, we are that really gets that sort of people and process and culture uh, around that. And, and often the whole sort of data lake world is very different culture in terms of how we analyze and, and look at the information. And we'll talk about that later in the in the call. So uh, we'll cut to all of this when it comes to the data lake. Um, but really, when you think of it, and it's worth thinking, this idea of big data really not only technology shift, but it's really a paradigm shift. And allow me to wax philosophical a bit. You know I tend to do that if you've heard me speak before. But really, it's a different way of looking at the world. So if you think of on the left, it's more of a traditional data warehouse where it's sort of a top-down hierarchical, I'm going to design and implement these companies building several right now where we're doing what information do you want? What's the data model for that? How do we define customer? What's the definition of customer? How do we store the data type of name and make that consistent? Super important stuff. Um, that is a very top down by design hierarchical approach or even more importantly master data. The whole point of master data management is to get that consistent view. So yes, by definition I'm locking that down a bit. I put some things in quotes there, manageable ready of information. I know there's some huge data warehouses up there. It's not that we're talking small. Same thing, stable rate of change. I know change tends to happen a lot. Um, so it's all relative, right? But that would be sort of your world of data warehouse, business intelligence, design and build. You know, um, If we go into the big data world, it really is a different idea. It's more about discovery. Right, so I would say that's almost more a democratic view. We look at the data, we analyze it, we have to discover it. It's more collaborative, interactive, iterative, agile, in my view. and larger volumes of information with an exponential rate of growth. You know, just think of click steam analysis of, of customers, and hopefully your company's growing this massive amount of information, Internet of Things for your product. And that's more your data lake and statistical analysis, and that's more your team on read, right? So I'm discovering things. Once I discover something of value, I make a data structure to store that or a variable to manage that. Um, but I'm, I don't know until I start looking at it. I have some ideas that links back to that un understanding your business strategy before you start going through things. If you don't have a customer facing product, you may not want to do it as a customer. It may be something else. Um, but it really is different. Of looking at things and don't mix the two. It kind of mixes, you know, why we're doing this. And so, again, this is, you know, if you think of the traditional way of the world, I always, if you remember from school, 
you know, uh, Linnaeus back in 1735, this whole idea of the hierarchy for organizing biological systems, that kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I remember having to memorize that when I was 10 years old or whatever it was. Um, and it's very structured. Think of the periodic table of elements. The whole beauty of that is taking a very complex system, having a chart, having rules. In my mind, this is the data model, right? In a way, how do we organize? How do we add structure? This is metadata around a very complex world. And maybe that was naive. Um, it was, we could really, you know, this is a different world back then in 1735. If we could just organize everything, we can understand the entire planet and the world because we have this, this classification. Um, probably not true. Um, there's so much complex that we don't understand, but it went a long way uh, to really help us understand nature and, and biological species. So it's a good thing. It didn't go away. But if you look at a lot of the research now, there's the idea of things of emergence or chaos theory or how much can we really classify? So this idea of emergence is the idea that there are complex systems and patterns, um, and, but you could think of a, a snowflake, right? No, again, religion aside, no one thing or person designed a snowflake. No, no two snowflakes are the same, but there's this idea of snowflakeness, right? So all the snowflakes on the right, you sort of left, sorry, you kind of know that there's a snowflake, there's patterns that come out. Um, there is just chaos. Right. So uh, sometimes used in, in building, uh, what do you call it, city planning. Um, you know, uh, we've all been at sort of a university or a, a campus or something, and there's these nice square uh, pathways, and what, where people really walk is the kind of direct way across the lawn, right? So when you think of city planning, um, rather than maybe just make sort of straight lines, they sort of looked at traffic patterns and what would make the most sense. So again, out of these chaotic traffic patterns, what would be the best way? I sort of liken that to social media. You know, I'm trying to get a sense of my customer sentiment. And sometimes it makes sense. I have someone on Facebook saying, I love my new Levi's jeans. It could be they're saying, it's Levi coming to my party. That's a name, right? But there's a sale. One of my partners is having a 20% a discount if I'm Levi's. Probably there's good things in there, but it's out of chaos. You sort of create these patterns. And that's almost the definition of the statistical analysis. I'm looking at chaos. I'm trying to create order, that schema on read in a way. <laughs> I'm from this chaos, so I'm finding patterns in the data. So that's in a lot of ways, that's the difference between a warehouse and a lake, right? So on the left is that more the kingdom phylum class order, customer product order number. <laughs> in a way, you're adding this layer of organization on a complex world, which is your company. It could be student courses. You know, it's not just customer and product. That's kind of the most popular one. Um, and, but that's a good thing. It doesn't go away. You need that. If I'm doing financial reporting, that I'm reporting to the street or reporting to the board, yes, I would like customer and product and order number and invoice locked down because I don't want my willy-nilly. I'm not going to randomly discover patterns, um, hopefully, in my financial figures. A little bit of art and science when it comes to some of that. But, yeah, it should be fairly locked down. In a link, it's different. That's more your that idea of emergence. I'm going to look at patterns in the data. Just give me the raw data in its native format, and from my statistical analysis, I'm going to find patterns, and I don't know what that is, perhaps, until I see it. Um, so that's more of that, that emergent technology. But they're both good. They both just have their place, right? Um, and I think the true value comes combining these together. So, you know, that's the, the golden nugget there in the middle, right? I have a data warehouse, and I have a data lake, and I can find new insights. So um, one customer I worked with, uh, they were a financial institution, and they were trying to do some analysis on their high net worth customers. So they did some amazing things with web analysis and scraping and finding information of of purchasing patterns and, and when folks have been sued and, you know, really interesting information or creepy information, depending how you want to look at it. Um, but when it came down to sort of finding that John Smith, um, high net worth customer, had these three lawsuits and had been doing this on the Internet in their own data warehouse, they had 16 John Smiths, or in their own master data, you could say, um, and they weren't able to easily link those new insights because their data warehouse um, and their master data wasn't clean. So unless you can link it with some of your customer data, some of these new discoveries aren't of value. But when you can, that's really where you get some really interesting insights. Um, so the, the beauty is really combining these two systems together. Um, this is, again, from that survey we did in Lessons in Data Architecture about adoption. And that's what you, know, you always hear these buzzwords, or I guess, I guess if you look at the Gartner, what are they, trough of different movement, they're sort of past the in peak of expectations of people sort of know that Gartner, where they have the height, height of hype, and then, then people get disillusioned because they didn't match the hype, and then you sort of get to this 
state of normalcy, right? So I was just curious. We used to hear so much data lakes are going to change the world, and they are. Um, is it a commodity now? Who, who, where, how are people using it? So this was the survey. Um, the majority of people are using a data lake in conjunction with the warehouse where they're using them. Some have it just as its own separate standalone solution, which has its place as well. But surprising, a lot of people still weren't. Um, but that's fine. I mean, there isn't always a use case for it. Not every company has unstructured data. Um, you know, maybe you just need it for typical data warehousing. So I don't know if that's bad nor good, um, but it was interesting. Although I was heartened to see, because I think early in the days of warehouse, there was a lot of mis of data lake. There's a lot of misinformation where people would say, we don't do data warehousing anymore. It's all in a data lake. And maybe that was the vendors. Maybe that was the maturity of the market. I'm honestly hearing less of that. And I think the data here shows that. Caveat is a lot of the survey respondents were from data diversity and not to pat ourselves on the back, but I think by definition, the diversity people sort of understand architecture and governance and structures, and that's why we're here, right? We, we have to talk about this stuff. So maybe had we done this more industry-wide, I think there may be more this, um, misinformation there, um, but they're really not the same things. So don't replace one with the other. Um, just use them for what they're meant to be used. Um, so we have a poll, and I'd be curious, the people on this call, to the different, you know, we had a lot of questions, but so just a simple yes or no. We're going to put together a poll. Are you currently, currently implementing a data lake? Yes or no? So I'm going to pass it over to Shannon, who's going to open up the poll. So you should see on the right there um, a little yes or no question. Um, so you hit the number, you hit submit, and there'll be a brief pause where we'll put the, together the answers and we'll get to see what everybody else says. Uh, we give you a little bit of time because you might have been multitasking and you're going to stop multitasking <laughs> and you're going to answer and you're not going to be shy because these are not linked back to individual people. So we don't know what you said as an individual. We just take a summary. So I hope you will answer. Um, and my answer, in fact, I do my own answer. So uh, Shannon will let us know when the poll is live and we will see the response. I'm kind of curious. I would think it's fairly high because I think people self-selected. Um, you're interested in a daily community starting one, but I am curious. So the poll has ended. Um, so I think shortly we should be seeing the results. Yeah, I am working on opening the Drum poll. Drum roll, please. Yes, it, it's calculating the results. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it should here we go. Okay, so a little bit more we're not um, than we're, but it's about half and half. So 45 um, out of the 45 out of the group, um, you know, 45 said they are are, and 50 said they are not, and then 48 of you are shy or multitasking or just being stubborn and didn't answer. Um, but I find that interesting. But I think that's fine. You may be joining this webinar because you are looking to enter the one and you want to know more. So just kind of curious. So it's been about half and half. Some of you are, some of you are not. Um, if anyone wants to share their experiences with implementing or questions about implementing in the chat, often we have quite a lively discussion as things are going. I will admit I'm a horrible multitasker, so I will probably not tell you about any chat because I'm talking, um, but feel free. Um, we'll do Q&A at the end. So as I mentioned, integrating the data lake and traditional data sources have a lot of value. And here's sort of a very high level schematic of that. But if you think on the left, you're, you're getting your sort of multi source data stream. And that's going to be your sort of data analysis and data lake in that light blue. That's often what we call the sandbox environment. I don't know what's out there. I'm just going to dump stuff out in the sandbox, we'll do some analysis, and we'll understand. That might also be data exploration. Maybe those are two sides of the same coin, depending on what you call it. There's also some sort of lightly modeled data. So it could be that I've done some cleansing and some analysis. Analysis or some structures on that. Maybe I put some things into a, um, a hive structure or something. Um, but it's still that sort of an exploratory analysis. On your right, it isn't just warehouse, but I call that more enterprise systems of record. You have master data, you have reference data. Are there marks, warehouses, operational data even? And, and the lines are trying to show and that on your right is more, hopefully, I have a data model for that. I've done some, you know, schema design, it's stored in system design. Um, but you'll see there's arrows between it, uh, between those two systems, and it truly is bi-directional. So this idea of, say, let's just take master data or reference data. If you think of those um, percentages earlier on the call, 
with the amount of time people spend cleansing data before they can analyze, I am sure that in, in any data scientist on the call, feel free to chime in if you disagree. But if there was a list of common country codes that were cleansed or common customer list that is correct, that can be fed into the data lake as a source, people would love to use it, right? So if there, so a lot of these enterprise systems of record will feed into the, can feed the data lake as a source. So here's your list of customers, here's your list of, you know, I don't know, sales regions or whatever you're looking at can definitely be a source into the lake. You may want to link that with social media analysis or click through rates or whatever. Um, but it can also go the other way. So sometimes the idea of doing this analysis is a, a field you may want to start tracking, right? It could be, a, I didn't think having somebody's social media Twitter handle is important warehouse, but after we did some analysis, it certainly is. So let's add a field. Or it could be, a, you know, a variable, a weather variable we're doing for sales data that people shop more when it's raining or they shop less because it's raining they don't want to drive right it could be things that you discovered were valuable um, and sent up to the system of record slightly off topic but this almost could be done for sort of local data sets that aren't necessarily a lake but it could be a SQL and I'm doing some local analysis for my region hey hey folks this is so important let's put it in the warehouse so again it should be bi-directional and that again that's the idea of discovery you're discovering something worthwhile you may want to store more permanently. The kind of purplish block there, right? Is this idea of collaboration and governance. So what is the governance around publishing something from discovery for the enterprise of system record? And what kind of vetting needs to be done? What kind of communication is done? Do, do people doing using data like even know where these reference data sets are? Are they, are they stored in a place that people can use it? Are the people talking together or am I talking or communicating via wiki or you know, whatever? Um, you know, method to share these insights because the whole idea of these insights is that you're sharing it with other people and, and we'll show some ideas around that. And above it is the reporting and analytics. So you could do standard BI reports, you could be doing sort of self-service BI and, and exploration or advanced analytics, which is probably more typical of some of this on a, a data lake type environment. And of course, don't forget the security and privacy at the bottom um, because that's just been, no matter where it is, if it's personal information, you need to track it in a certain way or if it's HIPAA, regulated information, you really shouldn't be drawing that out and just randomly doing exploration on, you know, things you shouldn't be. So uh, that, that spans all of it, which kind of well, kind of ties in with governance. And which leads to this idea of a data ecosystem, um, which I think is important to remember. Kind of my mantra there is, you know, the more data shared uh, either across or beyond the organization, the more formal the governance needs to be. So when we're talking about something like master data or reference data, yes, you really do need to have that more traditional, you know, kingdom phylum, class order, Linnaeus type structure, you know, customer product, product hierarchy, you know, that, that that is because that is so important as the core of the organization and it's shared across everything else, you do need the structure there. I would think kind of that layer below green, that might be your warehouse. I think that's maybe a little slightly, but not more, that much less um, loose than the master data. It could be, um, you know, so, some just data marts there as well. Uh, but that also is kind of structured by definition. The stuff in the light blue, that's getting a little more exploratory. Typically, you know, that might be operational reporting, or I have my um, own local reporting data set that might be relational, or it could be some analytical model data, or uh, there's structure around it, um, but it's, a, again, more loose or more local. I think when you get the dark blue, that idea of exploratory data, that's definitely your data lake zone. The whole idea is raw, lightly prepped data, do some ad hoc analysis. Should be a very light touch governance. Yes, don't let people put personal information out there. Don't go willy nilly. Um, I, I should know that you're rolling up a sandbox platform. You don't just go off and build your own randomly. Um, but the exploration itself should be allowed. That is the whole purpose. So you don't want to under govern your reference and master data. You don't want to over govern your data lake. And I've seen conflict and issues around that or, you know, because in some cases, and unfortunately in the days, in many, the tools are out there, it's easy to roll some of these things up and people will just find a way to go around you. <laughs> so don't over govern. And, and, and we'll talk about that later of that. I have seen too much of that of, no, oh, I don't want to go around the rules. So I'm going to go build my own lake and there's 17 lakes and, you know, that's not a swamp. What is that? It's just a very leaky lake district. Right? <laughs> you know, you necessarily really want that because that's not helping it. You, you lose the whole idea of collaboration. Um, and, and the idea is also that that 
not only interaction between systems, technology systems, again, this can be a link, it can be a local mart, it can be an MDM system, it can be a data warehouse, it can be all of those, but they need to interact together as an ecosystem. Um, just like a lake is part of a great, larger ecosystem with streams and forests and <laughs> mountains, right? So just as it's your, your data lake should, is part of a grander ecosystem. But it's also human beings and, and roles between that as well. And that I've seen can be conflict as well. So if you have your typical data warehouse roles, I think we're all familiar with those. You're your data warehouse developer, maybe your BI reporting analyst, ETL. You may have new roles with this data lake. It could be your data scientist, it could be this idea of a citizen data scientist. You know, your data lake platform, who, who's managing this platform? Um, kind of like your DBA, but for the um, data lake. And then there's sort of these cross-cutting roles. Um, it could be a data steward. You know, if, I, if I'm the data steward for customer information, I shouldn't care whether it's on a warehouse or a lake. I, I still care about that as part of my stewardship, right? Or on patient data. You know, I, I, it doesn't matter where it is. It, it, I'm still looking at that as if it's my entire ecosystem. A data architect. And this is, I think, something important to remember that um, a data architect, if you're the arc, you know, actually there's a data diversity article will be coming out of what would we mean by a data architect versus data modeler and that kind of thing. But there's different styles of data architect. There's the platform architect. So a data architect that's used to just doing data warehouse needs to expand her skills into things like like Hadoop and data lakes and cloud, um, and uh, because it isn't just one thing. Similarly, a data architect who might be looking at things like data models or enterprise architecture diagrams, don't just model what's in the warehouse, right, or what's in your you know, relational systems. Is it important to start looking or thinking of things that maybe you know, like maybe it isn't, maybe it truly really is just exploratory. But I think, unfortunately, I think data architects often are too much on that left with kind of your traditional data warehouse. Um, and there's a need to have at least those conversations for what might be in the lake. And are you honing your skills to things like cloud and lake architectures and things like Hadoop and, and other systems? Otherwise, you have silos again. So I think those are some data governance. Are you only governing stuff in the warehouse and you're not even noticing the lakes? Are you over governing the lakes? Do you understand what a lake is and how um, the data citizen data scientists really may need the extra flexibility. They're not trying to be, you know, unruly, <laughs> um, but, but it really is true that they need some flexibility and control. So I think all of those roles at the bottom really need to live in both worlds. And some of those human beings might be in both worlds. You might be using a warehouse and be a citizen data scientist, or you might be doing citizen data science in a warehouse. But again, as a simplification, I think all of these people need to work together just as those technical environments need to work together. Um, and then it kind of leads to the management of one way to govern is this idea through metadata. And you know I love metadata. Um, so there's different ways of managing metadata as well. So if you think of, and you may have heard me say this before as well, this idea of encyclopedia versus Wikipedia is almost similar, again, to this idea of a warehouse versus a lake. Whereas an encyclopedia, it's, it's sort of a vetted truth, right? The people in academia who, who define these, they sit in a room and say, this is the version of what a skunk is and whatever we have in our encyclopedia, and you publish it out. And it changes. It's not like, well, maybe a skunk is sort of the same. You want new things about skunks, and you put it in the encyclopedia and each update. Um, so it's slow. And then, you know, it, it, it's, just, you know, it's just sort of a standard um, body of knowledge. Wikipedia, right, that's sort of eventual consistency. I, I will when Wikipedia came out, it just seemed like this would be chaos. But you know what? I use Wikipedia all the time. And in some ways, you can say Wikipedia is more accurate because it's updated more often. You have a wider voices uh, looking at it. Um, it's changed. It's dynamic. Um, but really, it is sort of a different thing. And I almost think of the data lake like that. It's really more for data exploration, self-service analysis, insights. Um, but you can maybe get even better information by opening up your brain opening up your ecosystem and looking at different sources and finding those patterns. So each one is good for what it's good for, um, but I've also seen companies kind of use the wrong thing. So if we go back to that, that pyramid, um, make sure you're choosing a metadata or collaboration tool. Um, you're thinking of the environments. And this is hand the tool. I don't like to get a tool to ask me. I won't use names. <laughs> but um, there's types, and, and some do all well. But in general, in life, it's hard to be great at everything. So they tend to fall into categories. One is 
metadata repository, which is more your strict, I would say more of a stricter governance. I have a glossary that may be vetted. Maybe there's a feedback mechanism, but typically there's a group in your, your data governance lead that manages that, pushes it out. It may have a data dictionary, your approved sources. Um, super important, um, and there's some really good recent data diversity webinars on that, how you do that in lineage. I'm doing a warehouse. I want my source to target mapping the attribute level, and I want an audit trail. Um, I want to do PII or personal information labeling. I want an audit to see where, what databases have my PII. I want to classify secret data versus classified data and be very strict. And there's a reason for that because it's my last data, it's my warehouse, and I want to have that very rather formal metadata repository, and those tools are excellent. I sort of grew up on those tools. Um, but, world, this idea of the data catalog, uh, which is kind of emerging, and Gartner finally has its own magic quadrant or report on data catalogs separate from metadata repositories. And to me, this is the more Wikipedia, where it's more of crowdsourced and open. Um, and these tend to work well um, with data lakes. I mean, they're not mutually exclusive. That's where that piece in the middle, especially as that light blue, tends to be a mix where it can be structured, um, but there's still some exploration. There's probably some overlap between the two. Um, but what some of these data catalogs can do, they can do things like, okay, the metadata for a repository may be what's the data type for field X. The metadata for some of this might be, hey, what algorithm did you use? Um, great idea. What were your results? Um, what what does this field mean? You know, some of that is overlap. But maybe with the glossary, it's crowdsourced. You know, I thought um, this was age, but really it was, you know, date of birth certificate, which is different. I don't know. I made that up. Um, but it's more of a crowdsourced approach. Um, lineage is probably more high level, sort of by definition. You're not surely doing that direct source to target mapping like you are with the warehouse. Um, but a lot of them have sort of different things. Was this useful? Um, it could be that there's different ways to calculate total sales, but 90% of the people are using this one. Let's go this way. Or this is a really helpful algorithm. Um, this is the code I used. Almost more like a GitHub, right? <laughs> than Maybe more a traditional edit repository. Um, maybe it's more loosely tagging um, information. This kind of has to do with customer information, or hey, this might be helpful rather than your strict data classification. That might be more of a traditional repository. So again, there's overlap, and some repository tools are getting more to the collaboration. So collaboration tools are getting more to adding some of the structure. Um, but but just give that some thought before you choose one. I've worked with several customers in the past couple of years. They were frustrated by their tool because they kind of, they either got a catalog or what they needed was more of a metadata repository. You have a catalog and you want, sometimes you do want to create the rules. And you say, I'm, you must use this field for that. They, they just are not designed for that. You can't lock down Wikipedia as much as you can in an encyclopedia. Or people went with, uh, or had historically a metadata repository and they wanted to add more collaboration. And again, maybe the, the tool you choose has some overlap. Um, but just give that some thought because I have seen frustration with several of my customers. I had a tool and they're, you know, it's apples and oranges for what you're trying to do. Um, I'll be a little bit on this idea of a data catalog. Um, it's, again, that Wikipedia of, of harnessing tribal knowledge. So was this helpful? What, what are the queries or algorithms that people are using? Was this helpful? This idea of collaboration. And often, you know, even that data repository, they're starting to add this as well. Um, you know, you have a definition and then someone says, hey, actually, no, I, you know, three years ago I used something different. Is this the same thing? Or having chat around that can be really, really helpful. You might find things you didn't know just by getting a, you just can't talk to everybody. So having a web-based way for folks to do that is helpful. Um, again, avoid silo. So I don't know if the analogy works, but it is in my mind, it's good, these data lily pads, right? So what I've seen, um, and too often, is that because data lakes can be sort of easy to spin up, right? I can do a, I don't know, an Azure instance on my own. Um, it maybe happens without connection to the wider data strategy or the wider data governance. Um, and I've seen this, and in partly maybe this is, and maybe if I did the survey in the wider organization, there may be more confusion of what a data lake is versus the data warehouse. And I've seen maybe a sales team saying, I just want this information. I don't know. I'm just going to outsource and create my own lake. Um, and then, I don't know, marketing does their own. They've got the marketing lake. Um, then you have these lily pads across, and none of them connect. Um, and you lose all the value of the lake um, because you're not 
grading, right? So I bet Marketing wants to know what sales is doing. Or R&D as their own. Or Joe just wanted to play around and, and create his own. Um, and so that he loses the approach. And I think what I've also seen teams, you know, it may be, often it's the business doing this because they're, quote, frustrated with IT. IT took too long because there was too much governance, which gets back to that pyramid. Don't over-govern. You may, you may run the risk if you're manager of, of governing so much people just go around you um, and you don't want to do that as well. So what's the life touch? It could just be, and I've had some organization I've worked with just say, just let me know you've built one and basically tell me what's in it as long as we're doing the same thing. The, uh, the other piece of that is cost, right? You don't want to pay for a bunch of different instances where you could get an enterprise license for something and just have different, you know, um, the areas that people can work in. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons not to do this, but unfortunately I see this happen all the time, that there's always a data like lily pads where people just go off and explore. And maybe that's okay. Maybe it truly is a, um, you know, exploration I'm trying to help my own. But again, that could just be a cost issue. You're losing the scalability that you could have. But again, you may find something that's valuable and should really share. So again, if you can coordinate, Please do. Um, so some things to risk and avoid um, or to think about as you're going to a data lake. You know, one is just the platform. Do you want to have an on-premise thing? You're in control of that. There's costs. There's benefits to that, um, especially when you're thinking of security and privacy. You may not want to go. That's, it is a concern for some people in the cloud. I mean, the cloud, however, has a, the benefit. A lot of these lakes are in the cloud, especially when it truly is a sandbox. You've got the scalability. It's easy to spin one up. Um, a lot of these these uh, platforms are easy, and that's one of the I, and because if you think back to the survey, a lot of the hesitation was on the skill set. I, I don't have a Hadoop administrator where I can do this, but if I can, you know, have one of the cloud providers help me, or platform providers help me with that piece. I can even more easily spin it up. So give, give some thought to your provider. A lot of these also have the tools with real-time data streaming, and there's a lot of cool things that kind of come with these platforms. So give that one some thought. And again, please do that together so you don't have all the employee types of seen. Again, not only did people spin up different um, lakes, but all on a different platform. And, and again, you're, you're losing some of that cost benefit company together. Um, Skills, give that some thought. Do do you want to outsource the lake altogether? Maybe you want to hire. I, I don't really know if this is the, a thing for me. Do I want to outsource to a third party? They can do some exploration. If that is good, maybe I want to take it in-house. If I do want to do in-house, even to start, what training do I need? Um, if this is you on the call looking to do this, what training do you need to really take a different path or a different level to do sort of day like things? Security, who has access to this lake? This one comes up all the time. I mean, give this thought before you build the lake. So I've seen really successful, really expensive analytical lakes with, with what they have to have some third party or, or sales, you know, marketing, paid to have a lake. No one knew because there were security concerns. And when it was finally brought up, security law, um, and it cut off a lot of analysis. So do your due diligence first. Um, ask security, you know, what might be the issue. How is PII managed? So don't go so far um, that you, you can't use the lake because it's PII on it, which again, having gone built the lake and not having told people legal or, you know, security is going to be a little more nervous. Um, you said, hey, I'm building this lake. What are some of the, go to your data governance manager. What, what are some of the concerns? Um, and can you just do some simple things? Are you obfuscating information? Do you really need to store anything personal on the or can you get just summarized information on patterns without any PII? So please do think of that. And again, I always bring names to the innocent, but I've been at some very large corporations, and there was one we were sort of talking about the lake, um, and this well-meaning developer sort of raised his hand. He said, so are you saying I shouldn't be putting personal information, name and address and email out on the lake and the class? <laughs> and they're like, pretty, um, we'll talk to you after the meeting. And it was embarrassing for everybody because he didn't know. He had never been told he wasn't supposed to do that. And you can't assume people should know um, until they're told not to. So, again, just don't be dumb. <laughs> that wasn't a very technical thing to say. Um, but, again, sometimes it's a very easy thing. And one of my uh, clients I work with, they were very, doing a lot of this, and they just had a very simple yes-no check checklist. Is, is there PII or no? If no, go ahead. 
Um, so again, not that idea of light touch governance, they didn't want to over govern, but they didn't want to under govern either. And I think that's what key takeaway. Uh, cost, again, cloud is often the right model for scale user usage. One of my retail customers had a link for some of their kind of quick stream analysis um, for web and things like that. And they use cloud because around, they were a retail product around December and holiday time. They had massive scale of volume, and the rest of the year they, they didn't. So, again, a lot of this was raw data they just wanted, um, and they used the cloud for that. So that was a great model for them. On the flip side, again, the cloud is a very different model. That scalability is great, um, but sometimes on-prem can be cheaper, uh, depending on your usage. And, again, a lot of us grew up in the traditional world, and I had a customer just a couple weeks ago told the story. Um, I had nothing to do with it. Um, and quite a bit of money that people were spinning up sandboxes um, and were thinking, hey, it's just kind of like creating an access database or, or just doing my own little SQL Server, SQL Server instance and, and it's free. Um, and it's not because you pay kind of prescription <laughs> pricing. Uh, and they kind of got to shut them off. So people were creating all these sandboxes and they never shut them off and they're paying for them and they weren't. So again, that's a very simple governance checklist. It doesn't have to be rocket science. You don't have to go in and say what data are you using and is it conforming to a standard, but is it, did you turn it on, did you shut it off? <laughs> Do we know about that you're doing it, right? So there's just some basics, but kind of a, a checklist. Um, governance, you know, is there common semantic meaning? Is is there common data that people could be using to export to the lake? Do we know what a customer is? Um, are you even operating model of how teams work together, how things in the lake may be published? Um, you know, again, that who is even spitting up a sandbox, why um, don't have the lily pads kind of going off in their own silos? And then what is that life cycle? It could be sometimes you're using a lake just for some storage. I, I'm not even using it. I'm not analyzing it. It's just a cheap place to put stuff. That's okay, too. Um, but you just want to know that usage. When can it be deleted? You have that life cycle of, am I just storing? Again, cloud isn't free. You might have less experience. You don't want to just be putting out there forever. And most cloud providers have cold storage options where that life cycle becomes important. Um, and then the life cycle of, that I mentioned before, how do we move from exploration to enterprise, if that makes sense. Um, so again, uh, data lakes can provide significant an opportunity, and, and they're cool things. <laughs> um, they're here for a reason. Uh, data is getting more complex, um, and it's a great way to manage some of that complexity. Does go away? It's just another tool in your toolbox to have, have these two different data sources that can work well together, and just like the data platforms and architecture should work together, so should the people. So make sure you have the collaboration, the governance around that, and the management and operating model of ways of working. Um, together on this. Um, this will be on demand. Uh, for those of you who ask, I think it's next week or in several days, I'm generally sending out the link as well as the slides. Next month is on master data management, and that was kind of that top of the pyramid where it is highly governed. Um, so if you're interested in that, please join us. Um, just quickly, that white paper I mentioned is out on our website. It's also on the Diversity website if you are more interested in some of those trends and the details behind that. So, without further ado, uh, I do want to open it up to questions or thoughts or ideas. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Anna. Donna, thank you for another fantastic presentation. Uh, there's lots of questions coming in, and if you have a question, feel free to submit it in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section. Uh, and to answer the most commonly asked question, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording of this presentation as well as anything else requested throughout. So uh, diving in here, Donna, do you have any suggestions for training for Data Architect or for the Data Lake? Well, Dataversity is always a, <laughs> a good uh, source for that. Um, uh, sometimes the vendors themselves have some really great training. They have a vested interest in people um, getting to know, so um, I wouldn't discount that. Um, I think YouTube is a great <laughs> source. I'm always surprised. Um, you know, it seems like a place to look for pictures of kittens, but um, <laughs> it actually has some really great uh, information there as well. So um, those are three options that would be helpful. 
<laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Um, in addition to a metadata repository and data catalog, would you recommend any other methods of documenting, representing the semantics of data, for example, the data models and ontologies, to help correlate governance across traditional systems and lakes? Yes. Thank you. I'm going to give Dwight a virtual hug across. The, uh, he's my people. Um, yes. Uh, um, and I am a fan of data models, um, semantics, so all of the above. I think, too, you know, one of the misconceptions, and I should probably add that as a slide, so thank you for that topic if we do this again. Um, something like a conceptual data model I use all the time, or maybe slightly logical. That's a perfect way of kind of showing across um, a lake in a data warehouse. What do we even mean by customer? How does that relate? How is that different from a consumer? How is that different from X, Y, Z, a prospect? All right, so some of those just very high level definitions can be super important. Um, and I, I think, yeah, those, those um, if nothing else, also some high level enterprise architecture, where then does this customer data link to? Um, are very helpful. Ontologies can be interesting too, because that's more of a um, kind of a different way of looking at it, but it still has your semantic definition. So, yes, I'm sorry for that oversight, um, but I am a huge fan, especially in the data modeling world. I think that's a great way to kind of integrate those systems at a high level and get the conversations going. And and one more point on that, we talk about the people. Often the people invited to a, I often do kind of workshops with data, uh, so let's say high level conceptual data model. And I think we remember to invite the data warehousing and the architects and the business people, but are you inviting the data scientists? and some of these citizen data scientists that maybe you hadn't thought of and may have some really interesting ideas based on the data they've been kind of doing discovery on. So, great question, great comment. No, I, we don't, of course, get into recommending one vendor over another, but in general, what are some of the vendors that offer a data lake platform? Um, yeah, I hate vendor questions and you always ask me. So, um, Microsoft, Azure has some good, you know, Google has its own, um, Amazon has some, so, uh, you know, AWS type platforms. Uh, those are some of the, the big ones. You can do Hadoop um, in Cloudera and a lot of those, you know, poor, pure play vendors. And one of the nice things about the cloud vendors is they kind of wrap it up in a package and then there's, again, if you wax poetic on the definition of a lake, it may have kind of related tools that aren't quite lakes, but maybe it's a real-time data streaming um, service, and they, they kind of they wrap a lot of those other things around it. So my recommendation, especially if you're new to this, would be to start with some of the cloud providers because um, they make it a little easier, and they kind of offer some tangential things all in one night package and relational databases as well. So it might be a way to start. Uh, and there was a quest here to show slide 30 again, and I think we've got time for a couple more um, questions. And they made in the new platform these little things really small, so it's not as easy for me to find slide 30. <laughs> um, but unless somebody on the data diversity side has a bigger screen. I'm getting there. Wait <laughs> more. All right, what are the other questions as I muddle my way through? Um, let me know if you need. Um, so, 30. Uh, 30. All yeah. right, sorry, go ahead. I'm making a fool of myself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's the, it's, the, uh, it's the second to last slide. It's just the next slide up. Yeah, there you go. This. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Recently, an analytics leader told me analytics do not need data governance, and I laughed. <laughs> how, are, how do I educate them? Thank you for laughing. Um, well, um, some of the some of the ways to educate, and I won't go back to the slide because I can't see in these teeny little buttons. Um, the ones that has sort of a lot of the industry statistics can help you. Um, and this presentation had some of the percentage of data scientists that are frustrated, the percentage of data quality efforts. Um, and some of so lot, there's so much published around that um, that, that those can help you because we didn't you know you didn't say it. Gartner said it already. An advisor said it, or somebody else kind of gave some statistics around it. Um, I had a customer say that to me, sir, and, and you know, some of it's just obvious. It was he was doing some uh, scariest of things, some data scientists on medical record data. And he said, "No, someone told me that when you're doing data, so you don't need to do any data quality." And I'm like, "Well, if all your gender codes are wrong, and you're trying to say, you know, is, is lung cancer more prevalent in men and women, and <laughs> the, the, you're labeled wrong as men and women, your whole research is." Done. Yeah, I mean, and so sometimes it's that gut feel example, a kind of showing them example that the you know the analysis is only as good as the data itself, 
And then there's, you know, I've been doing some work with the university, and there's the, the governance of the analytical models. And depending on the person who said it, that might be over their head. But um, how did you, what model did you, and, and actually it was so refreshing working with the university because I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, I don't want to offend anybody, but often I'm working with a retail company where you're working with a sales guy that says, oh, I just want the numbers. And with the university, it was, you know, they would argue what methodology you use to get that number, right? Because they're, they're used to scientific research, but they have a point, you know, what, what model you use and what modeling technique. And there are governance methodologies around the analytic models themselves. So hopefully that's enough quiver in the toolkit to, to uh, in addition to laughing, um, <laughs> to tell our, that argument. <laughs> I love it. All right, Donna. Well, thank you again. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, thanks for this another great uh, presentation. Thanks to all of our attendees for all the great questions. We love how engaged everybody is. Um, just a reminder again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and the recording, and I will include a link to the um, research paper as well, so you'll have that available to download. Um, uh, and, and additional resources from Donna, as she does so much. Uh, thank you. So I well, hope to see you all next month in September, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.